Thanks for coming today, everybody. Have a great week. <laughs> right? Isn't that enough? Don't you feel like that's enough? Incredible. Thanks so much. The bronze and the yeah. I want you guys to clearly understand this, but I'm going to call this the best worship that I've been able to experience here. But you got to understand the scorecard I used to do that. It's only good worship if I can't hear myself sing. <laughs> so for the first time since being coming a part of the body and what God's doing here, it feels like kind of God came down to be with us to the degree I could not hear myself sing. Hallelujah. Right? Good stuff. Um, hey, continuing the series, Fit Body Boot Camp, Becoming the Body of Christ that God is calling us to be. Eight-week series, thinking about the fall and the body of Christ that God is calling us to become. Uh, like any individual, God has a plan for each of our lives, a thought, a way it should go, a will for it. The same is true as for the church, the body of Christ in this world, that it's in God's head, it's in God's mind what that should be and how that should look and uh, what our lives as we become the body, what that's all supposed to be. And that's what we're trying to just refocus in on this summer and thinking of the fall with that kind of a mindset. Getting in the mirror, saying who are we, what do we look like, how does that compare to God's word and what we should look like according to God's word as the body of Christ, let alone each of us individually, but as a collective group known as, you know, the body of Christ that's a part of the movement of Christianity on this earth, how are we doing if we get in a mirror compared to the Bible and what it calls us to? The things we would have to know and we would have to take a look at would be the great commandment and the great commission. It, it, it all comes down to that. That is God's vision for the church, each of our lives, all of our lives, and our collective lives, is that we would live out the great commandment, loving God, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. From cover to cover of the Bible, that is what God has intended for our lives to look like. That's when we will find what we are looking for, when we dedicate and pattern, commit, sell out, sacrifice so that our lives look like that. That's the vision of the church. And it, it's biblical and biblically mandated that the church, that has to be our vision. We can say it a bunch of different ways. The way I've always said it is we need to be radically committed to Christ, ruthlessly committed to loving one another, and relentlessly dedicated to reaching others. That's just a great commandment and in a way that like, has come alive in me and calls me every single day to live differently, to live for my most, uh, to give up the least, you know, to really go after God. We've got to be about great commandment, vision, love of God, and your neighbor like yourself. And then secondly, it's all about the Great Commission, the two greats of Jesus' life and his ministry, how he did it, we're now his body, so we have to center in on those same exact things, Great Commandment, and then the Great Commission, which is making disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. That's Matthew 28, 18, and 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Do you know what he's commanded you? To love God and love your neighbor. Discipleship is just helping people do that more and more in their lives and figure that out more and more in their lives. And us being committed as the body to see that be our mission. And that's what discipleship is all about. I've talked about it as the redemptive work of God in our lives. We come along each other so God's redemptive work can put us back the way that we're supposed to be. Loving God and loving our neighbor. That's the way it's all supposed to be. So we've been focusing on this through the course of these eight weeks. Great commandment, great commission stuff. Looking at the text. And then we can even break that down further thanks to the Acts 2 passage that we've been focusing on. The Acts 2 church and what it actually looks like when lives live this way that they're called to after the great commandment, living out that great commission fully, and you start to see, man, this loving God is really comes down to this ability to worship, like we just got done doing, but every single day, like we just got done doing, surrendering our lives to God and committing to obedience to live His way. 
That's ultimately what worship is. And to grow. To fill our lives with the word so that we can know him and knows how he, know, uh, know how he knows us. So that we can almost make that our life purpose. To know him and make him known. That would be how we love God, which is that first part of the great commandment, which is the fourth, the first four ten commandments of the ten, right? It's, it's rooted back that deeply. This is not just Jesus coming up with stuff off the top of his head when he was getting questioned. We love God and we love our neighbor. And how we love our neighbor is through accountability and sharpening of one another, of learning to serve and sacrifice to lift others up and put our life down so that others can have it. And the mission of ultimately sharing our faith and multiplying Jesus' life in another. Because Jesus' life was a great commandment, great commission life that we follow and we try to live out. Now, here comes the quiz. Ready? Take out a half sheet of paper and a number two pencil. We're going, it's go time right now. We said setting up this series. This is going to be more training than just like a pure homiletic induced sermon or message kind of deal that we as a body, where we are at, if we're looking in the mirror and we're looking at what the Bible says we ought to be and what we need to become for the fall, we need to be equipped and we need some training. So we put on almost like a, a different lens that we're looking at this series through and just the way we're talking through things and again, getting numbers one through eight and breaking down the purpose and the mission. It's training because we need to know this stuff. We are the body of Christ. If we don't know this, who knows this on earth? Jesus isn't on earth anymore in person, in flesh. That's us, the church. I think sometimes we, we play this way too lightly, knowing all this stuff. As long as we're going to church and trying our best, that should cover us. No way. Someone's got to step up. Someone's got to step in and fill the gap. Ultimately, the eight weeks of the series, all we're doing is breaking down each one of these characteristics. If we're going to disciple lives, we ought to be living discipled lives ourselves. You will reproduce that which you are. That scares me. I have three children. They're going to become like me. Let's go to the altar on prayer for that. Right? We're going to hit the pause button a minute. So yes, rendering to God week one, live in his way. We too know the word last week, which was exciting to cover through VBS and just see how focused that um, was and hearing the Bible stories, memorizing scripture, filling your life with that. So it's in a sense all that we know. Everything that we reference, we're not thinking of media and television and movies and music that we heard to try to make sense of our lives. We're full of the word. A disciple of life is like that, knows the word and knows how to handle it and bring it alive in our lives. And then this week, as the theme kind of God has already started us out on, is this just emphasis on prayer. And we, we have to lead lives that are dependent on prayer as much as oxygen. That we, we feel the need for that, that bad, and what prayer is, and how the Word describes it. That we, we need prayer as bad as we need oxygen daily, and, and we're mindful of that. Hey, you ready for this then? Oh, here's, this is funny. I was just thinking of uh, prayer through this week and over the last couple weeks, you know, when this is coming, and I was like, oh, where does prayer first, where do you see, first hear about prayer or see prayer in the Bible? Right? That, that'd be, let's go back there. We're thinking of Jesus' life a lot. We can look at Jesus, but technically if it's talking to God and being in communion and in close, intimate relationship with God, like Adam and Eve would have had to do that, Right? Well, then I looked at like what would actually be the first conversation with Adam and Eve and what that would make prayer. And it would be like, wow, that's not how to pray. But this would be, uh, is like makes an actually really good lesson of how not to pray brought to you by Adam and Eve. We could go to like an infomercial right now and learn this. But check this out. Uh, Genesis chapter 3. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God 
as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord, uh, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Number one, when you hear or sense God, do not try to hide. <laughs> like, I was like, man, that's amazing, and that's so funny, and yet that's kind of freaky, too. Because even in the second, if you can kind of picture where Adam and Eve were in the garden and what had just happened, and that they, again, the description of sensing God and kind of noticing or no, he's suddenly in the room, and you just didn't think he was in the room, but now he's in the room, and he wants to talk to you about things, and you know, you know those things that you know might be on your mind or on your heart that that could be about. So that's just crazy. Their tendency, their first thought, they sense him coming as they go and hide. Don't do that. Don't do that. That is not. That is not how. God has created it to go. That is the relationship with God and everything is rooted and based actually in the exact opposite, opposite of this. Seeking intimacy in the presence of God is, is what we were created for. Everything, even in the, the tension that we might feel if God is suddenly in a room and we're caught by surprise and we're thinking of our whole life and everything in it and everything that's gone on and going on and that kind of stuff, that what it needs most is the presence of God. And the acknowledgement that he's right there and showing up and that he's there. And yet, it's crazy that that step away kind of thought that comes to our mind that just takes us a minute away. Check this out then, it continues. But the Lord God called the man, where are you? As if you couldn't see him. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. When God asks you a question, do not try to deceive him. From it, like in hiding. Again, he's a talking out from behind him. Like this. Hiding. And just like making stuff up now, kind of just like that. Don't do that. Or don't do that either. <laughs> I'll fix that later. Um, yeah. Do not try to deceive, deceive God. Don't think that he doesn't see. Don't think that he doesn't know. And don't, don't think that he's not coming to you to help you. Don't think that he's, he's not coming to you to, to rescue you from where you are. I love him. That's the, the number really single best thing about being a dad is the insight that it gives you to being. Or the insight it gives you to being because you are. But it really gives you to the father your God, your Father in Heaven, because you feel those exact same things. My kids have done some crazy stuff. Anytime that they've done the craziest of stuff, I want to go to them and I want to rescue them. I want to help them. I want to love them. I want to come into them in that time because they're separated and I know better what is happening to them. I know more about what they feel than even what they feel. And I can help them if they don't hide and then if they don't start trying to deceive me as if I don't know? Like, that's crazy. And then he says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman who put me here with me, that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Sounds like something you've already learned this lesson. When God asks you a rhetorical question about your choices, do not blame someone or something or some situation in your life. The blame game. It, it'll get you nowhere with God. It'll get you nowhere that you're trying to get. It will snowball on you. The blame game not only doesn't work for Adam, the direct culprit, but then the Lord said, uh, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this with you that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. Again, another blame. Adams was a little more bold because he did actually blame God. Because that woman that you put here with me, <laughs> now, I, I clearly out because it's you. You talk to her. You, you go, you two have at it, all right? I'll be out. I'm 
I'll be cooking up the real world. <laughs> if you are an accomplice to an encounter with God, one, two, three apply to you as well. Seriously, that just that the utter nature of what prayer is and is supposed to be is so um, perfectly pictured there in its brokenness. And it couldn't be, and it is, it's this incredible insight to our human nature apart from God is high, is deceit, is blame. And it's actually, that's our best thinking when we're, when we're in it, when we're separated. And I, I love Genesis. I, I love that it teaches us so much about who God is, who he made us to be, and how the relationship is supposed to be. And the reason this is such a negative picture of prayer is prayer couldn't be more opposite. It's supposed to bring us into the intimacy with God and that closeness and really redefine our entire life and what we call good from there on out. The Lord's Prayer which Jesus, when he teaches on prayer then, this is what he teaches about prayer. And again, just in a sense, accidentally, or as God was just leading through study and prep to see the, op the, the two pictures that this um, presents, looking at the Genesis passage with Adam and Eve, and then looking at the Lord's Prayer that he gives us, and really even in light of the Adam and Eve side of it, seeing a whole new layer to one of the more religious prayers, like I was raised Catholic, so the Our Father, like, I just said it. <laughs> just said it again. My, my brain can say it because it's said it so many times that it's, it's a, you know, can become just a religious thing, but to get that layer of what it's calling us to and what's possible in prayer is a whole other story. So let's dive into this. Matthew 6, uh, 9 through 13. This then is how you should pray. Words of Jesus. Take note. If you're writing this down, because Jesus said so. This is then, uh, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Think of what Adam and Eve were making prayer into versus what this calls us to if we take what Jesus said. Our Father. Okay, I'm just going to go back to being a father and thinking of my kids calling out my name and how that just pleases me incredibly. Probably Emily is in the middle of that radar screen right now. She's my 15-year-old. Nick is 18, going off to college. Drew's 21, getting married in December. So just the timing of things and ages and stages. But Emily saying my name, I love it. She can't say it wrong. She can't. And even in one of her more sarcastic ways, Dad, Dad, I love that. That kind of dad, as long as she's saying, Dad, oh, I win. I win. Even when, it, when she's angry, she's talking to me. And as her dad, I don't care. That's the win. Is the conversation and the closeness that that brings and um, how that just sets up the relationship of what is about to happen. So opposite of hiding. So, so opposite of distance coming between you and God. Prayer is all about closing the gap. It becoming intimate, becoming proximate with God and being in his presence. Our Father in heaven. Think about Jesus and the way he knew the Father. And how he spent time with the Father. And how the Father was in him and he was in the Father. And it was the Father's will that he was all about. It was about, like in our language, I think it would be like Daddy. You hear that with Abba a little bit when Jesus is crying out that you want to translate Abba better? It's like Daddy, Papa. Real real close, real enduring. That Jesus is saying when you pray, you, you got, the goal has to be 
intimacy and their proximity, call out his name, it, it, you won't believe what that does to him. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So amazing is your name. This is about your kingdom and it is about your will. Your name, your kingdom, your will, my life, the way you want it to be. When God is coming close, that's what he is trying to help us remember. That it's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about your kingdom. It's not about your plan. It's not about your name. And so many times that can be a pride thing because we're trying to build our name. We're trying to build our kingdom. We're trying to make our will happen. But more times than not, it's just we get trapped. We get, we get trapped. We get isolated. And it is, it is our name. And it seems like it's our kingdom. And it seems like it's our will. And there's just outrageous pressure in our lives, in our heart, in our soul, in our mind. And we're not made for that. It can't be about you. It can't be about the world you're trying to build and make and chase and develop. And, and your will, the, the way you think you're going to do that. Come to your father, sit up here. I, you know, I'm in control of that. That the transition of just crying out to your dad, it's almost it would really be that step of surrender. Not my name, your name. Not my kingdom and all the pressure in it. It's you. This is on you. You got this. And your will and the, the way that this all plays out, it, this is your game. Why do I get in this, this life and why do I get in these panic attacks and this thing where I think it is all dependent on me. It is not. My Father in Heaven, Your Kingdom, Your will, Your name. Oh, read that in. Read that out about five times. Something happens to your heart, your soul, and your mind. You're letting go of things that are not supposed to be attached to you, hooked onto you, getting that you're, you feel like you're responsible for to that degree, and you're not. Give us today our daily bread. Listen to this. And this is more, again, this takes the religion out of the Our Father to think about this, how saying these words sets up the relationship that we're supposed to have with God, that we're made to have with God as our Father, being about Him and His kingdom and His will, and that He has this, that this give us today our daily bread, seeing all that we have being from Him. Think about it. Every one of us are going to have enough to get through the day. Will you be aware that it was God's goodness that gave that to you all day long, and that's why you had it, that leaves you at the end of the day full of gratitude and thankfulness like Joe was just talking about up here. Because you're going to have enough. You're going to make it. Even if you didn't do anything else right now, and what if in that, like, you just, you just noticed that that was God and you, and you were provided for and that all happened and, and you, you knew it was Him doing that and, again, then your responsibility is just this overwhelming, breathe that in, breathe that out. That's gratitude and thankfulness that fills your heart, your soul, and your mind because you have enough today. And I think a lot of us wake up every morning and we don't even know it, but like we're programmed in our flesh and in our brokenness to just be scarcity. Probably don't have enough of anything to notice what you have and take that in and be grateful for it. Man, we are so transformed if we're praying like this. Forgive us our debts. Our hearts must be sorted, sifted, and cleaned is what Jesus is saying. This is why he wants us to pray like this. Not because you have like tons of debts that you just got rid of like your heart. Your heart needs time and space to sort everything out. Your life is cluttered. Your mind is cluttered. Your heart is cluttered. Your soul is cluttered. Up from down is, is hardly known on a daily basis. Pray our Father. Pray His name. Pray His kingdom. Pray His will. 
see his provision coming and him taking care of it all and that gratitude and thankfulness fill you and then sort what is at odds what's not right what's not aligned forgive us our debts we know what matters probably in our hurry with Jesus following life will confess sin but it's probably symptomatic it's, it's behavior it's probably just naughty behavior Really childish like that. That's just a naughty behavior. That's not the problem. Why are you acting out like that? Take about seven steps back and figure out what's wrong with your heart, your soul, and your mind that has you engaging in that relationship that you've got no business engaging in. And that can be a relationship with a person, it can be a relationship with media, it can be a relationship with a substance, but you've got something else that you're going to to fill that heart, soul, mind, strength, you know, kind of need within you because you're operating on your own that's separating you from God to be forgiven of your debt is to be forgiven of your sin. And that's just the, the stuff separating you from God. Get, sort that out. Get that out of there so that you're with Him. And you, you're breathing them in, you're breathing them out. Your heart and your soul and your mind, and you, you have that. You're in His presence. That's why it's important to have that in the prayer that we got to pray like that. We've got to pray the prayers of forgiveness so that we can be free to be with our Heavenly Father. And we also have forgiven our debtors. The best indicator of how much of God's grace and mercy you are currently experience, is experiencing in your life is usually indicative by how much are you extending to others. How that because what that's ultimately reflecting is your view of God. And if you think he is radically judgmental and bitter and hard-hearted and watching everything that you do wrong, then you're going to watch everybody else like that. And you're going to keep score and you're going to keep track and see where you measure up and where they are and what those shortfalls are. If your, your heart, your soul, your mind will be poisoned by that kind of living. In the sentence before that your, the ability to you for you to receive forgiveness is directly dependent on how you're giving that out otherwise your heart will be hard God will be sitting there with a truckload of forgiveness for you but you can't have any of it because of how you let your heart become and your outlook towards others and you you stop being a fan and you're now a critic and bitter people are bitter because you haven't forgiven stuff in your past. And it's it's big stuff. The stuff that's hurt us, sin and being wronged and, and hurt and pain and that stuff. That's not little. But if you let it embitter you, you'll be bitter. And you, you won't be able to live how God has called you to live. You'll be short of that. Unforgiving people go around unforgiving. And they might love God and do religious things, but they're not warm. They're not, you don't feel love. You don't, aren't drawn to that because there's a wall and calluses and scales and hardness. When we pray, we've got to pray for that to it'll go away. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Set a good path. Set a good and right path for me is our heart. Is, is what we're crying out to God for. And lead us not into temptation. Don't lead us... Um, again, it's a mindset, and Jesus wants us to say this in our prayer for us. Not for God, but for us to set our heart on what God wants for us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The positive of that is set a good and right path for me, God. And that's what I'm on the lookout for. That's what, that's what I'm after. My, you know, my eyes are up. I'm looking out, and I'm just looking for that path that takes me closer to you, not closer to the things that take me away from you. I'm, I'm getting away from that in my life. The Our Father. Again, great prayer. 
I bet 90% of us know it and can recite it, but it can become so religious versus why Jesus taught us to pray this was this call in a relationship with God that would look like this, that would be personal and that would be intimate, that would help us know God and actually in just doing that alone, it would help God be known because the life you would lead if we really led out of prayer like that. Your aroma would be beautiful. You would be attractive to others. There would be kindness and gratitude and thankfulness oozing out of you. Forgiveness would be being extended. And you'd probably have people coming up to you that have done things and you're just wondering why they're telling you that they've done those things, but they, they know in you and spilling it over to you somehow brings them freedom because you're free. If we live a disciple lives, we're dependent on prayer because prayer is what transforms us into that kind of person. Knowing the word is so important because we get pictures, but prayer is what the transformation, that's actually the time and the place and the space that the Holy Spirit's working in to make us different than how we were or who we are apart from God. So as disciple lives that want to be dependent on prayer, that you be... It can't just be religious prayer that we're shooting for and I need to do more prayers in my life. No, we need to lead, lead lives that are released more like this and we need to pray for that kind of transformation through our prayer that saying like the Lord's Prayer turns us into those kinds of followers of Jesus. Because that is what we were created for and in doing so, that's what continues to tell the story in this world that there is a loving God. who is in the garden with you. With, right? There's nowhere that God isn't. It's just everywhere that people are acting like God isn't there and they're not noticing, they're, that's just hiding, actively unaware that they're hiding. The body of Christ, we're supposed to be the other space in the world that shows what it's like to see God, notice Him, Hear him coming with his footsteps towards you. Turn to him, see him, and then run to him with the deepest, most passionate heart, soul, mind, affection because we're rescued in him. I was thinking, uh, it's not in every text. It's like in parentheses in some Bibles that because of add into the original manuscripts and stuff, but a lot of times saying it, you'll end the uh, Our Father with the For Thy Kingdom Come. Oh, uh, no, for, uh, for Yours is the Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory, now and forever. Amen. And for whatever reason, I just pictured a hammock. Okay, see if you can catch that. I just pictured a hammock when I said those words because, like, where's there a better place to be than in a hammock? Right? Like, even today, as hot as it is, if you've got a shade tree and you've got a hammock hanging in that, and there's just a little bit of a breeze, you're in a good place in a hammock. And the reality of, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Man, could you imagine being in a hammock and feeling that? And then what, what matters? Nothing else matters. Your, your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, they're all satisfied because of Him, because of God. And all you got to do is just kind of breathe that in, breathe that out, swing a little bit, you know, oh man. And that's that part of prayer. And I'm making this up right now, but this is also why hammocking has become a craze. Right? Anyone do hammocking? That's where you and your friends get hammocks and you go out, like, let's go hammocking? Seriously? Have you guys heard of that? Well, we're going to start a new ministry called the Hammocking Ministry, also known as the prayer ministry of our church. You don't need the hammocking. But that's my, the hammock I use is my daughter's. All the, the ones I get for Father's Day always break. Well, my daughter's is one of these like pouch hammocks and then she go hammocking in. 
try bombers and oh man, is it good to be there? Okay, so disciple lives, we, we have to live it. If the great commandment and the great commission of what we're called to, and to accomplish that, to make disciples, to make disciples, we have to live these lives. It's what we were created for. So the prayers that this, this heart for prayer and seeing that come deeper into our lives is something we're going to continue to work at and continue to instill in us. The um, handouts this week that were around the seats, the prayer hand, and the armor of God. These are two other ways to just inventory like the mirror. Get in the mirror. Here's a good mirror. How is your prayer life compared to the Our Father, compared to Adam and Eve in the garden, and then compared to the hand tool that we would call it. And then a big one that we need to be doing around here, right at end, would be this, the armor of God prayer, which is putting on the spiritual armor and how that can add to our prayer lives and what that looks like. So if you've been paying attention during the series, every series we're handing out tools, or every week of the series, there's the memory verses that, again, is on the handout that's in the bulletin. The handout is parallel for each of the weeks with teaching passages, memory verses, the discipleship tools, and the action steps. Again, our discipleship tool today in the hand, the armor of God. And then I'll ultimately get into this, but if you've been paying attention, what we have is like what we would call and are going to call as the fall approaches our basic discipleship tools of the knowing God personally, knowing God's story, and the 33 things that happen to you in the moment at salvation. We've got those. We've got this, the five assurance verses when we start the relationship with God and your first steps in following uh, Christ in your life and how you go through those. We got the word packet from last week. We got the prayer packet. That is this DNA that we're building so that we can become this body that God is calling us to be. As the worship team comes forward to kind of send us out uh, with kind of the song we started with, just um, ending where we started with this entire goal of leaving and leading different lives that God is calling us into is the big deal. And the single, this is just absolutely true is the, the only way I can describe this. The daily practice of daily diverting 15 to 20 minutes of slow meaningfulness in your hammock setting your heart, your soul, your mind on God's goodness and His will for you. Continue to develop that in this season. Like play with it. Do something this week that you didn't do last week and see if that makes it better. If it was really good last week, do it another week and see if it still is a good rhythm of reading one chapter and then listening to a worship song and being in the rocker in the corner of your family room with the light on. Was that all good? Did it do it? Did you feel God's presence there? And did you, you sense him and then journal the thought that helped you live differently that day? Or you did that before you met that the body that figures this out and the body that has the most lives that are doing this and probably this alone is the body that sees you know, God move in the amazing ways that God can move in. Because we as his people, we as his body are doing what we were created to do and doing it in his intended way. So I would say that, that when will you do it? Where will you do it? What will you do when you do that? Cry out to God to show you what that looks like. Cry out to God to have the courage to talk to somebody else about some accountability to actually doing that. And again, that to me that would be, and then watch. Because what we will see will be amazing as God moves in and through the lives of us as a body. So, worship team, close us out with one more, and then we will go and be different people.